For our first intermission period today, we bring you a final talk on the Our American Way of Living, and the Opera Question Forum will go into action during the next intermission. As you know, these brilliant curtain talks by distinguished Americans have been presented by the National Council of Women through their well-known president, Mrs. Harold Vincent Milligan. This afternoon, Mrs. Milligan will talk briefly about the objectives and the results of this much-discussed series, and will also introduce a glamorous star of the Metropolitan Opera Company, Miss Lily Pons, whose subject will be, Why I Became an American. But now, Mrs. Milligan. Some 16 Saturdays ago, during the third intermission of the broadcasts of The Marriage of Figaro, I had the pleasure and honor to launch the series of curtain talks, which we have called Our American Way of Living. We of the National Council of Women, as well as millions of American men and women in all parts of the country, felt that it was very necessary at this time to stop, look, and examine with the greatest care what I might call a balance sheet of our American plan of existence. In other words, the main and only purpose in presenting this series has been to provide a searching analysis of the results which have accrued to us all through the century and a half of American independence. Americans may and do disagree politically and often economically, but all Americans are at one in their urgent desire to know the truth about our country and in their united determination to maintain and build these truths into a glorious future. We of the National Council of Women were by no means alone in our conviction that the sum total of this examination would be news so good, so forthright, and so encouraging that knowing it, all Americans would be better fortified to face the problems of today and tomorrow. And that, in essence, is what we hope the vast audience of opera listeners have learned from the brilliant parade of information which we all have been privileged to hear and absorb during these weekly broadcasts. We hope that these talks have strengthened the resolve of all of us to resist those voices whose only purpose is to play upon our emotions in order to incite prejudice and hatred and so destroy our national unity. The great scientists, artists, poets, and businessmen who have brought us the incontrovertible facts about our American way of living have proven beyond any argument that in our American system of free initiative, freedom to think, say, pre, pray, and do, we have at hand in serviceable condition the mightiest instrument for peace, happiness, and reasonable abundance that the world has ever seen. As many of our speakers have said, it is not a perfect instrument, but why should it be? If there were not imperfections in it, we would really have no goal ahead to work for. The great men and women who have appeared here each week have come with only one idea, and one idea only, and that was to bring to each of you and to all of us a true and factual report on the specific aspect of our American way of living which has been assigned to them. Dr. Robert Milliken talked about our inventive fertility, Herbert Hoover about our American democracy, Mrs. J. Borden Harriman about our American home, and Philip D. Reed about our American initiative. The important subject, is our American democracy efficient, was given to Robert E. Sherwood, our longer life to Dr. Thomas Parham, and our moral preparedness to Dr. Robert Hutchins. Abram Flexner, Carl Sandberg, Mrs. Sadie Orr Dunbar, David Sarnoff, Walt Disney, Carl Compton, and H.W. Prentice, Jr. brought us the facts on other subjects of equal importance. One extremely important viewpoint has been left for today, our final broadcast in this present series. It is the viewpoint of the millions of Frenchmen, Germans, Italians, Swiss, Irish, Greeks, and others who as citizens have become integral and honored parts of this great country we call America. Why did they come, and what did they find, and in comparison with what they had previously known, how do they like it? To speak for this great group who were once foreigners, but are now Americans in spirit and in law, we can think of no more popular or distinguished representative than the world-famous daughter of France, who ten years ago came to this country as a young, untried, and relatively unknown singer. 
I am referring, of course, to the gracious lady sitting here beside me, who was christened Lily after the French national emblem, the fleur de lis, and who is known far, near, and wide as Lily Pong. Mrs. Milligan, I am naturally honored to be asked to talk about what a few months ago I would have called your American way of living, but which I now have the right to call our American way of living. You have had such brilliant men and women before me that I feel that neither my brain nor, most sure, my accent serve me very well today, but I will try. You know, Mrs. Milligan, I have only been an American citizen a short time, but I have been seeing that America means since the day ten years ago when I first saw the skyline of New York. I think I felt American on that very day. I could not speak English very well then or very well now, but I believe I had a quick comprehension to name of what America was and what it has done for its people. And as the years went by, I learned more. I asked questions. I saw with my own eyes. So then I knew that this country to Lily Pons was home. And it is very good to have this opportunity to tell so many people that I believe about America. Miss Tong, what was your first impression of a country which in so many ways must have been so strange to you? In 1931, when I came to this country, a stranger, quite a little bit frightened, America mm -hmm. held out her hands to me and said, Welcome, Miss Lily Pons. You wish to sing? Bon. Come in and take off your hat and let's see what you can do. That is the exact truth. And I soon discovered that this was not just an exception made for Miss Lily Pons. I saw it happen over and over again, this cordial welcome to strangers and a sincere wish that they should go to work and do well. Is not that a lovely welcome to a new land? If you heard the talk of Dr. Flexner on our American freedom, you may recall that he spoke of this American open-mindedness in the following words. Freedom, in the fighting sense in which I am now speaking of it, represents the American conception of the way of life. It is the arduous way to live, for it is never satisfied. It is always struggling forward to something better, something higher. Democracy must always have its feet on the ground, but its feet must always be in motion. That is true, Mrs. Milligan. Perhaps no one who has been all his life, American all his life, can truly know and appreciate such an American ideal. You must have come from abroad to know the great difference between countries that look shifty to their tragic past and our America, which, because of its still young and glorious past, can afford to look happily and bravely to its future. The creative mind, looking always ahead, simply must turn to America for its nourishment and its tools to work with. Herbert Hoover too stressed that point in the opening talk of our series, when he reminded us that here alone in the new world today remains the air which creative minds must breathe. Here alone is the dignity of men and women still protected in this, the last sanctuary of the ideals of civilization. Yes, I think all people today wish, oh, so ardently for a homeland where there is still <coughs> laughter and where one has good reason to hope. Not only singers, writers and artists, but all people with the artistic need to build, wood carver, leather workers, lace makers, all the skill which America has admired in other lands. Yes, America has earned the right to take the responsibility for the future of music, of art, and maybe even of civilization itself. But isn't that a terrible responsibility for a country to accept? Yes, but I'm glad that America must take that burden. For I believe that America today really does not think of it all as a burden. 
There is something here born out of all these different races living together in the new world, which has the esprit, spirit, to march ahead with freedom and justice for all. America will not let what happened abroad happen here. I know it. Europe is different. Over there, too much come a complete rebirth of spirit. For everywhere you look are the ugly scars of past wars, monuments, ruins, daily reminder of all hates and all jealousies. There is hardly a foot of ground which has not been watered with blood. French farmers, for instance, turn up all weapons and shells wherever they plow. But here in America, it is so different. Over here, we have not this destroying heritage of hate and war. We know that men and women of all races and all kinds can live together and work together in peace and in harmony. America not only know this, but she has proved it. This, I think, is the very most important pattern of life which America has to offer the rest of the world. And probably the one thing which America, in her inner heart, values the most. Robert Sherwood certainly agreed with that thought, Miss Pong. In his earlier talk at this microphone, he even went so far as to say, and I am quoting, we value our way of living more than we value our fortunes or our lives. It is that spirit which has animated the whole story of American progress. But not all Americans know this truth about their own glorious country. You must, every one of you, know and appreciate more all these wonderful things you have. Don't be careless with them. Don't allow yourself to be divided by things which are only of temporary importance. In patriotic unity is your strength, regardless of what kind of decisions you make for tomorrow. Know what you are fighting for, said President Hutchins of Chicago in his talk. Truth, justice, and freedom can only conquer if you know what they are and are devoted to them with your whole heart. Bon, but that is well said. I wish I could show you the difference in the tired, all countries of Europe. In every land, an island, and continent of the earth, people today are praying for our American future, because it is their only hope of any future. And to them, I would say, mes amis, have no fear. I know America. It will not stop building for tomorrow. Yes, I have found that America has the warmest heart in the world. Never have I seen a country which has so many societies and clubs to help everybody and everything. The poor, the sick, the old and the crippled, and even the dogs, birds and horses. But you have the most beautiful roads and parks. You have music and dancing everywhere. You have thousands of fine schools filled with hundreds of thousands of well-fed, smiling American children. American children who represent all the race of the world. Here, they learn together and play together, and tomorrow, God willing, they will work together. And these, my dear friends, are the reason why I love America and why Lily Pons became an American. For the National Council of Women and all of us, may I say, thank you, Miss Lily Pons, and our thanks, too, to all of you of this great radio audience who have so enthusiastically received and supported these vital curtain talks. And once again, our deep gratitude goes to the Texas Company, whose generosity has made possible this reaffirmation of the benefits we enjoy from our American way of living. Thank you, Mrs. Harold Vincent Milligan and the National Council of Women for this splendid series which has been brought to us under your auspices. Today, our Opera Question Forum has its last session. And sitting opposite me 
are three eminent persons who look as if they were just brimful of sparkling, absorbing things to tell us about opera. One of them is a new shining star of the opera world, a young American coloratura soprano whose name was added to the Metropolitan roster last December and who made her debut uh, just six weeks ago tonight singing the prima donna role of Gilde in Rigoletto. She is Josephine Tumania, and we're extremely happy to welcome her to the Opera Question Forum. Miss Tumania, I know what a slow and often discouraging road a young singer must travel. Tell me, how does it feel to have arrived? Well, if you think I have arrived, that's all right, but I think yet I have to arrive. I It'll be a long time. I think you're too modest. Your audience no. says that you have <laughs> arrived, and having arrived, I hope you're with us for many, many moons. Thank you. Another of our guests today is the noted composer and music critic Virgil Thompson. Mr. Thompson, among other things, is the composer of an American opera, Four Saints in Three Acts. And during this past winter season, as music critic of the New York Herald Tribune, he has been providing his readers with provocative and stimulating music reviews. I'm just wondering if we're taking a risk in putting an operatic soprano and a music critic side by side. Do you think we should be careful about that, Mr. Thompson, as in the old game of keeping the missionaries and Indians apart? <laughs> who's the missionary and who's the Indian? Well, I don't know. I think the critics are usually the scalpers, aren't they? <laughs> we seem to be getting on all right so far. <laughs> well, from your criticism, you, uh, I think you rather like Miss Tumania, and I'm glad it's that way. Otherwise, it might be rather embarrassing for both of you. Our third guest is a man who has achieved a distinguished career in more ways than one. He is Frank Black, General Musical Director of the National Broadcasting Company. The musically-minded members of our radio audience know his work in several fields as a conductor, especially as a pioneer in concerts of music for strings, and also as a transcriber, a composer, and a pianist. By the way, Dr. Black, this new weekly program of yours called New American Music is arousing quite a stir in musical circles, isn't it? Yes, we've been getting quite a few letters, about five or six hundred a week. Good. We're asking for criticism, by the way, of each of the concerts or pieces. Which reminds me that I have a young friend who wishes to submit some manuscripts to add to the mm -hmm. voluminous amount you already have. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, I think we're ready for our questions now, so let's go with the head with the first one. Uh, Miss Jane Orson of Chicago, Illinois, wants us to name at least six reasonably important opera characters who in the operas play the parts of professional musicians. Any hands? Mm -hmm. Mr. Mania. Uh, may I say Don Basilio, the music teacher in the Barber of Seville? Well, that's right. Well, uh, how about the ten trumpet players in Lohengrin? <laughs> <laughs> well, they play pretty well. They're professionals, and they're on the stage. I suppose we can count them. Uh, um, the three Stop. just now in Aida. The three uh, just no, six, Aida. I mean. Well, how, about, um, how about professional singers? There are quite a number of singers, too. Uh. Uh, Hans Sachs and Meistersinger, could that be? Well, how about he was a professional cobbler, rather, wasn't ah. he? <laughs> how about Siegfried? He played the horn. Was he a professional musician? <laughs> well, I don't know. It sounds like it, usually. <laughs> well, I don't know. I'll let count that out. Mr. Uh, Florida Tosca. From Tosca the was an opera singer, singer, yes. And how about La Gioconda, who was a ballad singer? How about the our friend uh, in, the, uh, in La Boheme? Oh, Schoenard. Schoenard. Oh, right. Schoenard. And the master singers of Nuremberg, well, perhaps they were amateur rather than professional. Well, Tannhäuser and Wolfram in Tannhäuser were certainly uh, musicians. Mr. Milton Hale of uh, Springfield, Massachusetts writes, I hear the leading characters in opera all play their parts in precisely the same traditional manner. Identical gestures, the same movements on the stage, and the same tempo in their vocal parts. Is this usually true? Mr. Thompson. It used to be more or less true in the Italian and French uh, provincial opera companies because that enabled uh, traveling uh, stars to fit into a local company with practically no rehearsal. It was uh, always a second-class practice uh, embalmed under the name of tradition, uh, but it was a very convenient practice. Uh, it doesn't exist very much today except in the case of the Wagner operas. Who's, uh, of which the interpretations are pretty strictly traditional, as determined uh, over a 50-year period at Bayreuth under the leadership of the composer's widow. Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. Here's a letter from 
Miss Alice Oliver of the city of San Pedro de Macorís in the Dominican Republic, who writes, In this far island, you may be interested to know that the tones of your broadcast come in remarkably well. I would like to ask your guests this question. Are there any operas in which the music of more than one composer is used? Uh, Dr. Black. Yes, there are um, the singing lesson and the uh, Barra Seville. Yes. The uh, Last Rose of Summer, which is sung in uh, Martha, isn't it? Interpolated yeah. in Martha, yes. On the other hand? Well, let me see. No, that's about all I can think of. In Madame Butterfly, uh, there is a brief reference to the Star Spangled Banner at the mention of whiskey and soda in the text. <laughs> yes, those fragments of the Star Spangled Banner, right? <laughs> and there are many references to the Marseillaise in uh, various French operas. Uh, but the, the references to national anthem uh, is in operas are very common, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Any others? How about uh, Prince Igor by Borodin, which was finished by Rimsky Korsakov and Glazunov? And Turando by Puccini, I'm told, was completed by Alfino. Alfano, yes. Alfano, is it? Yes. And Alfino. I have an eye to the name. And Boris Godunov by Mussorgsky was reorchestrated by Rimsky Korsakov. Mrs. M. DeLong of Weinboer, Pennsylvania, wants to know why it is that a flute or piccolo is always chosen to accompany a coloratura soprano who wants to sing an aria, uh, when she sings an aria, rather, and is this invariably done in every opera for a coloratura soprano? Miss Duanea. Well, in most of the coloratura operas, but I wouldn't say all of them, and I think because it's more or less a challenge to the voice. The coloratura voice is the only human voice, I think, similar to the flute. Yes, probably more closely attuned to the quality yes. of the soprano voice. Uh, do they use a piccolo sometimes? Well, I've never heard of a piccolo being used. I haven't either. Have you? Mr. I've Tom? heard of clarinets. Clarinets, yes. I think, too. I don't know of cases of piccolo being used to accompany... Well, I think the only reason a piccolo would be used is if the man forgot his flute. Really. <laughs> <laughs> I think usually the um, piccolo and the... Uh, and uh, Rather, the... Uh, the clarinet and the flute are the two instruments used. They certainly wouldn't use a bass tuba for an obligato, even for a basso cantante, would they? Mrs. Dorothy Allen, 161 South Main Street, Salt Lake City, Utah, writes, is there any real difference between so-called destructive and constructive musical criticism? Or is it that uh, destructive criticism is so labeled by someone who has been hurt by criticism? I find that every time I say that I did not like a piece of music or a singer, one of my friends tells me that is destructive criticism. Mr. Thompson? The use of the words uh, destructive and constructive with regard to criticism uh, are neither of them very accurate because uh, criticism is the uh, description and analysis of what takes place. Uh, the uh, destructive or constructive uh, nature of the, or repercussions of that, are quite an incidental matter. Uh, naturally, uh, anything that uh, tends to uh, uh, tear down the uh, artist's uh, faith in himself or his uh, professional reputation is, from his point of view, destructive, and anything that tends to build either of those up is, from his point of view, constructive. Uh, but uh, neither private uh, criticism uh, spoken to persons when the artist is not present, uh, nor uh, public criticism, which is uh, read in the press, uh, is primarily directed at the artist, nor is, it the, is its function either the building down or tearing up, uh, building up or tearing down of the artist's uh, morale and career. Its function is informing the public what kind of a show took place. Uh, and uh, if that happens to be uh, uh, injurious to the artist uh, or his reputation or his morale, uh, one is very sorry, but uh, one tries to uh, tell the public the truth because uh, in the long run, uh, one is paid by uh, the public's confidence in one's telling of the truth rather than by the artist's satisfaction in having his morale built up. That's rather the function of one's personal friends than of public criticism. Thank you very much. That's a very constructive answer, I would say, Mr. Thompson. H.O. Hazen of Tulsa, Oklahoma writes, 
I have read and heard several times that Verdi wrote Aida as part of the celebration of the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869. But in the musical encyclopedia, I find that it was written for the opening of a new opera house in Cairo. Can your guests tell me which is correct? Was it open the gates to a surge of waters or a surge oh, of okay. opera lovers? Dr. Black. Well, I think both are correct. Uh, it was commissioned uh, for the opening of the Suez Canal. It happened that, uh, happened that the uh, Caterpillar Theater was to be opened at the same time. Uh, the theater, I, th I think the date was 1869. Uh, however, the opera was finished, but it didn't open the theater. It right. didn't open, uh, the opera wasn't produced until two years later, because uh, I think the scenery and the costumes were held up in Paris during the war at that time. And uh, about two years later, the uh, Christmas Eve, I think it was. That's right. The, it was the, was the premiere was uh, That's right. on Christmas Eve, 1871. 1871. Thank you, Dr. Black. Sam Lakin of New York City wants to know if it's true that the role of Carmen can be or has been sung by practically all types of female voices, from a coloratura soprano to a contralto. Maybe Miss Tumanier can help me out on this point. Well, I don't think really for a coloratura soprano, more for a mezzo, and uh, many dramatic sopranos have tried. I heard of a Spanish soprano, I don't remember the name now, but I was told that she did Traviata and the Barber of Seville and many coloratura roles, and then did the uh, role of Carmen besides at Covent Garden. But I couldn't. Many, uh, <laughs> many, uh, many uh, singers seem to have a mania, they all though, want to sing the role of Carmen. Have a, I don't know uh, why. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. Uh, it has been sung uh, successfully by such different voices as uh, Madame Schumann-Heinck and Mary Garden. Madame Schumann-Heinck was an alto, although she had a range of four Cs. She sang a high C with perfect ease, uh, as well as the low. Uh, and uh, Mary Garden was a soprano and sang soprano roles all her life, with the exception of Carmen. She sang for some 10 or 15 years quite successfully. You never heard of a coloratura singing at all, did you? No, because it's quite. far too much middle range. Yes. Uh, here is an interesting question from a young lady who is a relative of the great Enrico Caruso. Her name is Maria Caruso, and she lives in Ozone Park, New York. It seems there have not been any new operas by American composers for a long time. Why is this? Is it that American composers are not particularly interested in the general form of opera? Mr. Thompson. The correspondent states that there have not been uh, any American operas for a long time. He left out the verb, but does he mean there have not been any written for a long time or produced for a long time? If he means written for a long time, I think he is in error. If he means produced uh, for a long time, I think he's probably quite right. And if he wants to know why, I think the problem the question should be addressed to the management of this and other operatic institutions rather than to me. Because I'm a writer of operas, not a producer of them. Well, I think he meant... Um, I, well, he doesn't say here whether he meant... Uh, uh, he probably means... Produced that, uh, or written. He probably means produced because the, the, the public in general doesn't know of the writing of operas unless they have been put on the boards. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Thompson. Have we time for another? No, I'm afraid our... Our um, time is just about up. My watch tells me that the bustle of activity backstage must be nearing an end with the third act scenery almost in place. And, and since that means our intermission is nearly over, we'll have to wind up our question forum by saying thank you very much, Josephine Tumania, Virgil Thompson, and Frank Black for making this afternoon's session so worthwhile and so pleasant, even if it had to be so short. The Texas Company asks me to express also its sincere gratitude to each and every one of you who contributed questions to the Opera Question Forum during these past weeks. Whether or not your questions were used, we appreciate your interest and help in giving us your ideas, and we hope that you have found these periods of opera information enjoyable enough to repay you for your effort. To each of you whose names uh, and questions I read this afternoon, the Texas Company is sending by way of thanks a special Victor album of Red Seal operatic records. And now from opera in general to the particular opera which the Metropolitan is presenting this afternoon, Verdi's great musical story of love, jealousy, and tragedy in ancient Egypt, Aida. <laughs> 